this content is being brought to you by the Bourbon Real Talk American Whiskey Aroma Kit. This is a tool that I put together to help all you whiskey aficionados out there develop your palates. You can sit down with the vials and train your senses, or you can sit down with a great dram and break that whiskey down to its components. If you have any interest in purchasing a kit of your own, head on over to bourbonrealtalk.com forward slash shop and pick one up. Thank you for listening. Welcome, Bourbon Real Talk listeners. Randy Sullivan here with a special guest that has a very exciting background for anybody who loves food, wine, or spirits. I have Joe McAuliffe with me. How are you doing today, Joe? Uh, got Pretty you good. Right Thanks time. for having me on. <laughs> right, as you, right as you took a drink. Um, so I was lucky enough to be introduced to Joe by uh, my friends that run the Cigar Podcast that I posted up the other day. And when I started doing research on your background, Joe, I thought, wow, what, uh, what an interesting career in several subjects that I find fascinating. And then your background is uh, pretty interesting as well. So I read that you speak Italian, Spanish, and obviously English. Is that correct? That's right. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> awesome. And you do a lot of work in the wine industry in Italy. Is, is, is that is my understanding correct on that? Yeah. No, I, I do a lot of judging in Italy, too. Well, I, I, I will tell you that my journey into whiskey actually started with wine. So when I was in my late 20s, I was at a nice restaurant and tried to order a glass. And the waiter kind of shook off my order the way a catcher would shake off uh, a bad pitch, right? He, he didn't let anybody else know that I was ordering the wrong wine. <laughs> But he, he didn't want me to make that mistake, and I felt inept. And so I went out, and I got the wine Bible, and I read it cover to cover and got pretty interested in collecting wines. But I guess it was probably about 2010, I opened up a bottle of Chateau Petrus, and I enjoyed it, uh, but it, it made me kind of realize that this was – a hobby that I probably needed a higher level of net worth to continue further in because all the stuff I wanted to drink was so expensive and it was usually gone within an hour when I opened it. So I converted my allegiance over to the brown spirits and the rest is history. So how did you get into, uh, you know, wine and spirits? You know, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I'm not sure how I got into wine. I sort of grew up with it and just, you know, liked it, was interested in it and sort of educated myself and just got into it deeper and deeper. Um, you know, my, my, I got into whiskeys really uh, via Scotch whiskey. Mm -hmm. And when I was a graduate student, there was a, there was a little bar just off Harvard Square that had like a dozen single malts. This is the late 1970s where a bar with 12 single malts or, 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 or thereabouts was pretty rare. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I used to go there with friends and, and we started sampling all these whiskeys we had never heard of, you know, Lagavula and Lafroy um, and whatnot. And then it just kind of grew from there. Yeah. Now you actually attended MIT, is that correct? Right. And what, what did you get your degree in? I was in international relations and finance. And Rather that's when it, mix. <laughs> that's when I find that there are so many interesting backgrounds that end up getting into the wine and spirits industry. How did you transition from that path? Because you did work in that you used your degree after college for a time before you got really full-time into the wine and spirits world. Is that correct? Yeah, I worked in government for a while. Yeah. And so how'd you transition from working in government into spirits? Well, you know, I mean, I've written a lot about uh, sort of international politics and security, and I still do. And obviously I write about wines and spirits. So I'm often asked, you know, how, how, you, how, how I ended up with such an eclectic mix. And the, I hope my answer always is that if you look at the state of the world, it would drive you to drink. <laughs> so the two actually go hand in hand. <laughs> that actually makes sense. You know, I, I find that people who are interested in government often are interested in history. 
And history is really what has drug me into the collecting of wine and of, of spirits. Um, is there any correlation there? Does it like kind of trip your trigger doing all that research and learning the history of uh, the, the hobbies that you're interested in? Yeah, you know, and I pretty much went down the same path. I mean, you know, as a historian, one of the things I've always found quite fascinating is the fact that I think spirits and humankind interest in fermented beverages has had a disproportionate impact on history um, that is generally assumed. Okay. Um, and to suggest that somehow, you know, history is being shaped by man's desire for for spirits and fermented beverages almost makes it unseemly. But, you know, at the very least, um, I think part of what triggered the agricultural revolution at the end of, you know, at the, at the end of the Neolithic period was a desire to have a, um, uh, a permanent or more reliable um, supply of fermented beverages. And we know that, that fermentation and the, and the fermentation of beverages for human consumption goes back easily 10 to 12,000 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know that because we can find residue, you know, on, on clay pots and stuff that we can analyze to determine that, in fact, they held fermentable, um, uh, fermentable liquids. The other interesting thing is that, um, you know, alcohol has had an interesting impact uh, on history. I mean, Peter the Great nationalized the vodka industry in Russia to basically get the the profits that he used to to uh, to build the first Russian navy. I mean, during the during the Anglo-French wars from you know from the period of Louis the Fourteenth through the end of Napoleon at Waterloo, uh, Parliament financed uh, you know the British Army and the British Navy by all kinds of taxes on alcohol, on malted barley, and whatnot. Um, so. Uh, it was, I mean, it's it's a recurring theme. You know, you look at the history of the United States, for example, um, before the Louisiana Purchase, there was no way of getting the agricultural surplus of the Ohio and Tennessee valleys to market. Right. And it was just too difficult to do. Then once the, um, the United States acquired New Orleans and control of the Mississippi, they could ship down stuff down the Mississippi. And then after... Um, the building of the Erie Canal, they had a way of transporting goods from the Midwest um, down through the Hudson to New York City. It's what made New York City such a major port. Um, so alcohol, or, or converting the agricultural surplus, which was primarily corn, uh, into alcohol was a way of retaining the economic value and the caloric value of the surplus corn. I mean, that's why there is... That's why people started basically distilling um, in places like Kentucky and Tennessee. I mean, prior, in the early 19th century, there were literally hundreds of distilleries all over that part of the world. And then once it became possible to ship agricultural commodities easily, then those places that were known for making particularly good whiskey, which was primarily Tennessee and Kentucky, because of the underlying geology of those states, continued doing so. And all the other places just sort of, you know, faded away. Right. So, I mean, distillation has, has had an interesting impact on human history. It's a recurring theme that goes back literally thousands of years. I, I have often argued that in the United States, we've almost turned our back on our own history because of the ripple effects of prohibition that most Americans don't understand how big of a role whiskey and alcohol products have played in the history of the United States, the amount of money that it raised in taxes, the wars that it's financed, the growth that it's financed. And so it's kind of refreshing to hear a expert as yourself uh, back up that, that position because you know people don't even know that George Washington was a distiller. It's not that he was just a distiller, um, he was the biggest distiller in the United States. Now, he didn't become a big distiller till after he stepped down from the presidency. But after that, he was the single biggest distiller in the United States. 
prior to the Revolutionary War, the single largest export industry in the United States was rum. New England was the largest producer of rum outside of Barbados. And mm. the records aren't complete. They might actually even have been bigger than Barbados. Um, rum exports were accounted for something like 70 to 80 percent of all of New England's export earnings. And they drove all kinds of other industries, cooperage, metalworking, etc. Mm -hmm. Virtually every one of the founding fathers was either a distiller, um, a lawyer who represented distilling in this in interest or someone who had invested in a distillery. Mm -hmm. You know, what triggered what began sort of the, the American revolt, um, you know, really was the Sugar Act. And the Sugar Act wasn't about sugar. The Sugar Act was about British attempts to control the molasses trade because molasses is a byproduct of sugar refining. Now, what in um, when the rum industry be, really took off at the beginning of the uh, at the beginning of the 18th well late 17th early 18th century, the French government, in order to protect the cognac industry, put a limit on how much molasses could be converted into rum. So the sugar planters in the French West Indies had a surplus of molasses because they they ended up with the molasses as just a uh, byproduct of refining sugar. So they would sell that molasses to the Americans at much better prices than the English would sell it to them, the English, uh, the, the English colonies in the West Indies. Mm -hmm. So one of the provisions of the Sugar Act was to force the colonists to buy British molasses by essentially prohibiting them from getting their molasses in the French West Indies. And so what the Sugar Act intended was that British molasses from the West Indies would be shipped to Great Britain, and then the American colonists would buy their molasses in Great Britain and ship it back to, uh, to North America. Of course, the effect of all this would have been to, to, to uh, dramatically increase the cost of molasses for the colonists. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we don't, you know, we don't, uh, we don't teach kids when they're in high school that that what started the the road to the American Revolution was the fact that the British were messing around with the colonists' rum business, <laughs> which happened to be the most lucrative industry in the thirteen colonies. I but actually, I mean, the I did the not know that wasn't about sugar; it was about molasses. That's what got the uh, the colonists all riled up. Wow! So you're also an author. So not only do you contribute to Huffington and Forbes and military.com and the Hill and all these different places for both wine, spirits, food, and also political writing, but you've written several uh, books, correct? That's right. In your research for, let's pick these, the, uh, the scotch, you've actually written a couple of books about the scotch industry, correct? One in 2015, yeah. one in 17. So in your research for that, um, does, is there any factoid that when you discovered it in your research um, surprised you? Is there anything that sticks out that you're just like, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't believe that this thing turned out to be true? Well, what was interesting is how closely interwined uh, alcohol distillation was with alchemy. Okay, now, I, which, I've never heard this. It's actually quite interesting. So essentially, um, you know, I guess what you'll call what we can call medieval alchemy or the genesis of medieval chemistry, although that's uh, to call it chemistry is perhaps a bit much, was really based on this idea that goes back to, to the Greeks, to Aristotle, that there were four prim prim primordial elements earth, fire, air, and uh, water. And that everything was composed of, of, of one or more of these materials. Well, and these were called the essences. Mm -hmm. Well, alcohol was seen as the fifth essence or the quintessence, which is where quint the word quintessence comes from, from mm -hmm. fifth essence, because it, it had all of the, characteristics of the other four essences. It was a liquid like water, 
it would burn like fire. If you left it exposed, it would vanish into the air. Mm -hmm. And any any um, organic object placed in alcohol would not decompose. So uh, alcohol was seen as sort of this magical essence, elixir that had all kinds of properties, including the ability uh, to transmute uh, uh, lead into gold. Now, there, in, in the history of Scotch whiskey, everybody talks about this first written efferent, a reference to uh, Scotch whiskey when uh, a friar um, was commissioned by King James to uh, produce um, uh, water of life for him. Mm -hmm. And that's always cited as this is the first written reference to the production of, of whiskey. Um, I believe it was James II. Um, but what people don't realize is that James II, who was, who was very heavily involved in, in, in alchemy and in, in, in experimentation, didn't commission the alcohol um, so he could have toddies with it. He commissioned the alcohol, again, because it was seen as this magical substance that could prolong life, um, could potentially, you know, uh, transmute base metals into gold, and had all kinds of potential applications. Which, if you were an ambitious king, would 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 uh, could be quite useful. Mm -hmm. So that was a factoid that you discovered when you were writing the Scotch books. So I think I read that you're working on a tequila book as well. Is that correct? Yeah. The yeah. history of tequila. Were there any shocking factoids that you discovered when you were researching for the tequila book? Oh, I haven't finished writing it yet. But you know, what's really interesting about tequila is that it tequila started appearing in the United States sort of in the um, second half of the nineteenth century, and in those days, it was actually uh, sold as Mexican whiskey. Mm -hmm. And there are references to, you know, Mexican whiskey coming from Mexico into Texas or Southern California. And what was, and it was actually tequila that was being exported. Mm. There are essentially two types of tequila. There is um, what used to be called mixto, which is now simply referred to as tequila, which by law has to be 51% agave sugars. And the other 49% can be any type of sugar. It could be mm -hmm. cane sugar, corn syrup, whatever. Um, and that percentage has changed. Um, it's been as low, I think, as 20%. And I think there were a few years where it was actually even higher than 50%. But now it's said by law at 49% or less. And that's sort of the you know, the low end tequila that, you know, that fueled a thousand ragers and university you know, fraternities <laughs> and whatnot. And then you have 100% agave tequila, where the, where it's made from 100% from agave sugars, which is kind of where the growth area in tequila is these days. And that's where you're getting, um, you know, all of these craft producers making tequila. You've got a handful of big producers that essentially make um, mixto, which is, and of which the largest is far and away, Corvo but most of the small producers are just making 100% agave tequila. Hmm. Now, when you're researching for a book like this, do you travel to the region and like meet locals and do that type of research or is it mostly? Oh yeah, I'm a nerd. Yeah, I get pretty nerdy into this stuff. So yeah, I mean, you just have to immerse yourself in it and, uh, and it's impossible to immerse yourself in it without actually, um, you know, going to these places and visiting them and talking to folks and, really understanding the process from the ground up. See, I've, I've heard really fascinating things about the culture surrounded around the tequila industry. This all starts with mezcal. And any distillate made from a base of agave is a mezcal. Mm -hmm. So it happens that starting in the late 17th century, there were a number of... Uh, distillers that um, emerged in Jalisco and, and specifically in the town of Tequila. 
that made particularly good mezcal. Mm-hmm. Um, so so much so that over time, uh, their mezcal came to be branded as uh, mezcal de tequila. Mm. And it was something people would ask for. And in the late 19th century, I think it was like 1896 or something, um, at the Paris Exposition, this is the, 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 the World's Fair for which they built the Eiffel Tower, uh, a number of tequila producers um, submitted their tequila in the brandy competition and did very, very well and took all, took all sorts of awards. Um, and from that point on, the producers in tequila pushed to have their tequila or their mezcal uh, recognized as uh, mezcal de te- tequila officially. And then over time, the name got truncated to just tequila. But one of the interesting things about tequila is that from the late 17th century on, its production uh, was already um, concentrated in the hands of maybe a dozen families, mm-hmm. most of which are still in the business in some capacity. Nice. Um, so it was always sort of an, uh, an oligopolistic industry um, from the very, very beginning with just a handful of producers really controlling um, really controlling uh, the production of it. But until probably the 1940s, 1950s, it really was um, uh, a, a Jalisco item. You know, mm-hmm. it would, some of it got to the States and, and you would see it along the border towns and whatnot. But it was really something associated with Jalisco culture. Mm-hmm. And starting from the 1950s on, um, you had this enormous influence that Jalisco um, exerted on sort of Mexican culture. And it was really around, uh, some, one of the things that really drove it was Mexican cinema, and especially what they call the charro culture, sort of the Mexican cowboy culture. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Jalisco has a um, sort of cowboy tradition. In fact, um, a Cuervo, has a museum in tequila um, really devoted to the sort of the history of the Mexican cowboy. And, you know, a lot of what we think of and what we associate with Western culture and Texas culture and Texas cowboy culture really came from Jalisco. And it came and it preceded its emergence in the United States by, you know, a century or more, in some cases, almost two centuries. Um, but the, the sombrero, the, the style of dress, the, you know, chaps, I mean, all these things that we sort of associate with, even the, the cowboy hat all really originated in Jalisco and eventually made their way into the United States. Well, the Charo films were hugely, hugely popular in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And you had a whole generation of Mexican, um, actors and actresses like Pedro Infante, um, that were sort of the John Waynes of, of Mexico. And the success and the popularity of the Charo films was one of the things that really transformed tequila from a regional Jalisco drink to a spirit that's really now associated with all of Mexico. Wow. Wow. Well, I, I knew that there was some rich history in there. I'll, I'll probably have to get your book whenever you finish it so that I can uh, round well, that out. One of these days. One of these days. So one of the things that fascinated me about your background is that your experience and how well known you are in the industry has provided you opportunities to be a judge in some of the spirits competitions. What spirits competitions have you have you judged at? Well, I'm a judge for the International Wine and Spirits Competition in London, the IWSC. I'm a judge for the Irish Whiskey Awards. Uh, I do judging for Vin Italy, and that's just wine. That's not spirits. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I'm a judge for the World Drinks Awards. So I've judged rum, tequila, various things for them. Uh, so those are kind. Of, those are like sort of the yearly ones, the standard mm-hmm. ones. And I always hear people say the same thing when they start talking about judging a you know, spirits competition or whiskey competition. Everyone's like, I, I want to be a judge. How do you become a judge? I want to try all those whiskeys. 
but I've actually heard from judges that it's not as sexy as you might think. It's not. It's a lot of work. I always, um, I wrote a piece a few years ago called "So You Want to Be a Whiskey Judge," mm -hmm. essentially describing what you do in a, um, in, a in you know on a when you're judging. So um, you know, in a typical judging day, um, you'll judge for four or five hours. Uh, in that day, you will probably taste. 75 to 100 plus whiskeys. Um, the process consists of, as I always describe it, sip, write, spit, repeat. <laughs> um, you don't swallow, obviously. Um, a, a tipsy whiskey judge is very, very bad form. Um, the way you know the uh, the the tasting is is organized you tend to start with the youngest whiskeys and end with the oldest so i have a long standing tradition of always actually swallowing the last whiskey of the day because it generally tends to be one of the better ones mm -hmm. um but th the reality of being a whiskey judge is that you don't actually drink any of the whiskeys <laughs> what you do uh what you do do is drink a lot of water to stay hydrated Mm -hmm. So in a typical four to five hour judging session, you know, I'll average close to two liters of water, which of course, if you drink that much water, what's the next thing that happens? Lots of bathroom <laughs> You go to the breaks. head a lot. Right. So I always say judging, judging spirits, whiskey or otherwise, mostly consists of drinking a lot of water and going to the bathroom every 20 minutes. <laughs> so when you are doing one of these, uh, competitions how many whiskeys are set in front of you at a time um how much time do you have with each whiskey and you know give us some details like that well you know it depends um it depends on the competition so for, for example for the irish whiskey awards the last couple of years um i couldn't go to dublin because i had conflicts so they sent me 130 samples, you know, all of them organized by the different types and ages and whatnot. And I could just sit in, you know, sit in the kitchen and on the dining room table and take my time, you know, drink or taste each batch. Um, and, you know, write up my notes and do How my How many scores. are in a batch? Well, in other words, um, you don't get all of the whiskeys together. All right. Mm -hmm. So you might, so you might have a group of, um, um, you know, blended whiskeys under 10 years or blended whiskeys that retail for less than, you know, $30 a bottle. Then you might have premium blended whiskeys, 30 to, you know, $70. And then you might have another, I mean, the categories change depending on what's submitted. Mm. And then you might have a category super premium, you know, $100 and up blended whiskeys. Um, you know, if you're judging scotch, you might have, uh, peated whiskeys from Isla as one category. So all of the whiskeys that that fit into that category um, get tasted at, together, and mm -hmm. they're judged against each other. You're not going to judge a peated whiskey from Isla against a sherry matured whiskey from Speyside. I mean, that wouldn't make any sense because they're two very different whiskeys. So they're broken up by um, you know uh, how they're made, where they're made. Uh, relative price points, etc. Uh, it just depends what gets submitted. So, um, so you know, what's in the category could be anywhere from you know half a dozen whiskeys to a dozen or two dozen at a time. Wow! And then you you know then you you go through it and you ju and you you know you judge it. So uh, as I was saying, so in some cases you're actually alone when you judge. Um, okay. You know, with the IWSC, for example, you're in a room with, typically with four or five other judges and, um, and a, a panel chair. And that tends to be much more interactive. So, you know, what happens is they'll bring you each judge a tray with, you know, say a dozen different samples. You know, everybody goes through that tray. Each of their trays uh, makes their notes, come, you know, comes up with their scores. Um, and then at the end of the round, and you, you, you go through it pretty quickly. I mean, you're going to taste, uh, you know, 100 whiskeys in five hours, um, uh, you know, take notes and discuss them. 
um, all in that all in that space. And then when you're done with the round, um, the, um, the you know you uh, there's the panel chair will ask everyone for their scores, and, and the scores are recorded. Mm -hmm. And then what happens? And you know, generally, what I have found is that uh, in a good judging round, the scores tend to be fairly tightly clustered. They're all within, you know, say five, ten percent of each other. Yeah. Now, um, if you have a score that's an outlier, then the panel judge will come to you and he'll say, you know, Randall, everybody scored that whiskey eighty to eighty-five. You are a ninety-five. You know, what was so exceptional about this whiskey that you gave it um, such a high score? Or you gave it a 70 and everybody else gave it an, you know, gave it a silver and you wouldn't even give it a bronze. So mm -hmm. what was it about this whiskey that you um, didn't like? And, and you have to give your reasons and you can't just say, well, that's how I felt about it. You have to say, well, you know, I, I uh, rated it highly for these reasons, or I rated it lower for these reasons. And then the panel judge, would uh, ask anybody if they want to change their scores based on what you said. Mm. Um, sometimes you might get a situation where um, uh, the average, you know, the combined rating, which is what determines the medal rounds, um, just misses or is just slightly over the line. And again, if the panel judge would say, okay, um, you know, our average score is 79.9. Um, that's just on the edge of getting a silver medal. Um, everybody was over 80, except you, Randall, you are 70. So you're the reason why it's not going to get a silver. You know, how strong did you feel about your score? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, oftentimes in those situations, a judge will say, you know, maybe I was a little too hard. Um, you know, I can raise my score to 75. Gotcha. Um, to get it over the line. So it's very, very uh, interactive. And uh, the idea is to, to really, you know, uh, to really come up with the consensus that everyone is comfortable with. And, you know, sometimes um, the panel judge will say, hey, Randall, it's not going to get a silver because you were exceptionally low. And you might say, you know, I'm sorry. I just don't think it's a very good whiskey. I don't think it's a silver medal whiskey. And I, I just can't bring my score up. And which right. case then that, that's the score. Right. Um, I find that fascinating. You know there's the the scoring is almost a black box right and most of the competitions they 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 work like that there's a you know a a bronze silver gold you know some have double gold whatever and what i find is that the average consumer when they go up to the shelf and they see that bottle and they see that it won gold they think that it came first place in a competition. Right. That's that, and, and that's the goal of the sticker is to make the consumer think there were all of these whiskeys that were submitted and it came in first place. And most of the competitions work the same way where, you know, if you're and and, and this was one of the things that I actually didn't know. So basically what you're telling me is, is that in most of these competitions, the score 90 or above is gold. 80 to 89 is silver and 70 to 79 is bronze. Is that generally how it works? Yeah, that's about right. And 95 is like double gold. Double gold. Yeah. So that's typically how it works. And I've heard um, the, you know, the and it could be 95, could be 94. I mean, every, every competition is slightly different, mm -hmm. but generally speaking, yes, that's kind of what the breakdown is. So as because if if you have spent all of this time as an author to educate the public, um, is there any part of you, like deep in the back part of your brain, that kind of shies away from the way that the results of these spirits competitions are presented to the public? Is there any part of you that makes it's a little bit uncomfortable? Well, like, I think, yeah, I mean, I think... Um, first of all, I think hundred point scales are complete nonsense. Um, there is no practical hundred, right? What's that? Nothing gets, nothing gets judged below 60, right? Like, isn't it really a 60? Well, to get judged below 60, there's gotta be an obvious defect. Right. And in a big competition, it's very unlikely, um, that you will get something that's clearly defective. 
Um, however, there are exceptions. I remember one year judging Chinese wine for the IWSC and that we had this wine that was, that was brought in and everybody sort of looked at it and said, Oh, you know, this is, this must be defective. So, you know, uh, so we called in the, the, the attendant and said, you know, can we, can we get another pour of this wine? Because you always submit two or three bottles right, in case right. one of them turns out to be defective. And they poured a second bottle. It was exactly the same way. And, and then finally it struck me that what, what I found really odd about this wine was that I was getting this sort of soy sauce aroma out of it. This yeah. be Cabernet. And so, you know, again, we called in the attendants, you know, something's wrong here. Can you tell us more? Can you, you know, tell us what this is all, what this wine is? Well, it turned out that, that the wine had been matured in barrels that previously held soy sauce. Gotcha. And, you know, in, for the Chinese producer, um, this was a big selling point and, and, the, and the wine was very popular precisely for that reason. Right. And, you know, obviously for the, <laughs> for the judges, they thought it was pretty much a monstrosity. Um, <laughs> but those are really the exceptions when you get something where, where you know, people say, oh, my God, what, what, you know, what is this? Mm-hmm. Most of the time, the wines are, you know, technically uh, well made. Now, they may not be great wines, but they're well made. Sure. Um, and the same thing with spirit. It's very rare um, that you will get defective spirits. Now, one of the things that happens with whiskey, for example, um, whiskey is produced in about 140 different countries. So in a judging competition, you'll have Irish whiskey, American, Canadian, Japanese, um, you know, uh, uh, Scotch whiskey. Gotcha. You'll have um, now increasingly English whiskey, you know, whiskey made in the United Kingdom or in, in England as opposed to Scotland. And then you'll end up, you'll have Indian whiskeys oftentimes. Um, but then you end up with this sort of miscellaneous world whiskey category. Mm-hmm. And um, um, what ends up in world whiskey could be pretty interesting sometimes. <laughs> um, because it's a real hodgepodge. So, um, you know, and like I remember one year there was a whiskey from Hungary, uh, which was actually quite good. Uh, and then they had another one from Indonesia, um, which was pretty bad. Um, so, but, you know, this is obviously a local producer. They're not, they're clearly not exporting or doing a lot with it except selling it locally. And I'm sure they thought, hey, if we could, you know, win a medal at a, new, at a prestigious international competition, you know, that would be, that would be good for the brand. Right. Trouble was, was pretty bad stuff. Sure. Um, in fact, I remember looking into it and realizing it wasn't even a whiskey because a whiskey has to be based on a mash bill of grain. Right. But oftentimes in Asia, you will find whiskeys that are made from molasses, mm. which technically makes them a rum, rum. not a whiskey. Um, and, but they're still packaged as whiskeys. So, uh, in the, and in the Indonesian case, it was in fact a, a, a molasses based spirit and nothing to do with whiskey, but they still called it whiskey. Mm. So you can, yeah, you can get some some pretty far out stuff from on occasion, but those are really the exceptions. But you know, if you're a major uh, beverage company, the stuff you're producing is from a from a technical standpoint going to be quite good. Nice. Well, this is a actually fascinating topic for me because I live in Texas. I support the Texas Whiskey Association. I've interviewed many of the distilleries that operate in Texas and, you know, people don't understand that Texas was at one point a a whiskey producing region, just like all states in the United States, but post prohibition, you know, it never really fired up here again. And we didn't have any spirits production companies here until I think 95 or 96 when Tito's had to hire attorneys to educate the TABC about how it was actually legal to get a license to produce spirits in, in the state of Texas. And the whiskey industry here is about 12 years old now um, with Balconies and Garrison Brothers being the pioneers. But this last year, Whiskey Magazine um, held a you know spirits competition and Iron Root uh, Republic Distilling submitted their Harbinger whiskey 
And it was the, the way that they do their spirits judging is they do um, non-Kentucky bourbons against other non-Kentucky bourbons. And then they have a separate competition for Kentucky bourbons and they do it all blind and they narrow it down. And then at the end, they make the winner of the non-Kentucky and the winner of the Kentucky uh, compete against each other with the judges blind. And somehow Iron Root Republic won the best bourbon in the world from Whiskey Magazine's competition. And that caused a lot of controversy and people were saying, oh, these spirits judges, you know, must be living high on the hog from all of the, um, you know, kickbacks that they got from Iron Root to, um, you know, make them the winner, yeah, right. blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I, and I did a podcast to try to educate the general public. It's like, okay, first off, Iron Root produces about 150 to 200 barrels of whiskey per year. If they wanted to buy off judges, they wouldn't have the money. One and two, they don't know who the judges are. Three, the competition is blind. Four, Whiskey Magazine is not going to rep- you know risk their journalistic integrity to try and name the winner. You know, it, there's like so many layers of like this is ridiculous and that's not how it works. Um, as a judge, have you ever been influenced at all to try to pick the winner of a competition? Thank you for tuning in to Bourbon Real Talk to listen to whiskey historian Joe McAuliffe. It's so fascinating to hear from a historian's point of view how bourbon has shaped the society that we live in. You won't want to miss part two, where Joe delves into how altitude, light, weather, environment affects your palate. We talk about how aging whiskey in hot climates affects its flavor and the difficulties associated with that, especially in Texas. We delve deep into what's going on in the Texas whiskey scene. We talk about why bourbon is aged in new charred oak barrels and not used barrels like the rest of the world and how that's impacted the flavor of the world's spirits. Very fascinating. You won't want to miss it. So please subscribe and be prepared to tune in next week so you can hear part two of this episode. Thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you next week.